I'm Ankit Machala. I work as a technical lead at Postman, the API development platform. And today I'm going to talk to you about primarily moving from REST to GraphQL and providing a structured thinking approach while uh, you are doing so. And this talk is a result of this question, that moving from GraphQL or layering GraphQL on top of REST can be easy. And that's the premise on which we started, uh, because we at Postman were adopting GraphQL, and we built a layer on top of our existing REST APIs. And it is, uh, it's, a, it's a common thing that it's pretty easy to do that. But I found that a little bit confusing and not that straightforward. And why I don't think it's easy? Primarily because of the first thing, that both have different design principles. That GraphQL, first of all, is built towards building APIs and schemas which are product-centric. On the other hand, REST is focused on building decoupled applications. Now, although these may not seem contradictory at first, but they are completely different goals and may end up confusing the user or the person who is developing the schemas as to what am I actually building towards. Moreover, GraphQL has similarity with RPC. Uh, even if you see a few getting started tutorials, you're going to see things like get user, get accounts, or get movie, which kind of uh, gets you to think that, oh, it's very similar to RPC. And down the line, you may end up building schemas which do not scale properly. And lastly, the reason which I think it's the most difficult is because thinking in graph itself is difficult. Even though human, as humans, we love thinking in graphs. We should think in graphs. But when we move from REST to GraphQL, our thinking itself is biased. Uh, which is what affects our schema design. So to understand this better, let's take an example. We are trying to build a team here, which has one organization. For example, Postman is an organization. It has multiple teams within the org. Each team has certain employees or users. Users can have multiple accounts. And users can also belong to the org, like the CEO. Does not belong to any team, but directly to the org. Let's try to model this. And the first way we do it is the REST way, which is the most common. We have certain orgs endpoint, slash org, slash ID, slash org, slash ID, slash team, similarly for users. And here, hierarchy makes sense to us. Moreover, we have microservices. We might have a team and org service handling all these things. And you might have user service, uh, which handles user-related endpoints. And this is what we have right now. And now we want to move towards a GraphQL schema. So the first thing which we do, which I call is not really a GraphQL schema, most of us end up building a graph rest schema, which is not really rest, not really graph, somewhere in the middle. And I'll explain why that happens. We have these uh, endpoints, which is the same ones in the previous screen. Now, these endpoints bias us and maybe influence us to build a schema which just embodies this. And we end up building a schema which looks like this. No need to look at the schema. Just pay attention to type names. We have org user, org team, we have team user, which kind of makes sense. A team user might have a different property from uh, existing user. An org user might have some more properties. And this is the kind of schema which I initially ended up building. And I think most of us do start off in this way. And if we look at it more graphically, this is how your schema looks like. Uh, you have uh, different types, and that's how they are related. And the biggest problem which pops out to me in here is, that we modeled the schema as a set of disconnected trees and not as a graph, whereas it should have been a graph in the first place because, well, GraphQL. And uh, the reason this happened is because we did not think properly in the first shot. And this talk is geared towards that, giving you a structured thinking approach while you are building GraphQL schemas. So how do we think in graphs? The first thing which uh, it, in this structure we'd follow is activities to be done. This is not an industry term or anything. I just coined it. Uh, what it simply means is it is a textual representation of every user action. So a user wants to purchase. A user wants to see a listing of all the products. Just a simple blatant description, which helps you think from a user perspective. It also helps you cover product flows, some things which might have been missed in the specification. You, you might end up discovering them while you are writing this. And for people who are aware of this, it is very similar to JTBDs, uh, which is called jobs to be done. But it's just that they are much more fine-grained. Activities are much more fine-grained than jobs. 
So in our example, this is what it looks like. View all teams in an org, view all users. No need to read this again. It's just a description of what you do. It's, it's like take a paper and a pen and keep writing what you want the flow to be like. The one thing to keep in mind is to focus on the user and not the UI. While you're doing writing these descriptions, make sure you don't end up using terms which are never exposed to the users. You might be tempted to uh, expose things like spacing uh, or brand primary color and all those things, but those are UI-specific concerns. Think about from a user perspective what you tell the user, what the user expects from your system, and then uh, write those things. Once you have done that, we end up doing noun analysis. Now, I did this in my database management class in undergraduate, and I thought I'm never going to use it again, but here I am. Uh, it simply means you just highlight the nouns in your description. What this helps you in doing is it helps you identify objects, like name, place, animal, thing, uh, and which become your common types. They help you identify relationships between various things. And if you come from the world of database, it's very similar to when you are building an ER diagram. You are essentially finding entities in your product flows. Once you have these entities, our example looks something like this. We have team, we have org, we have user, and we have account. We just have these four uh, uh, types, and that's it. Once you have these types, you just have to find the relationship between them. So again, no need to follow any sort of flowchart rules or whatever. Just write down all the types which you found out and think of the relationships which they may have. For example, a user might belong to an org. A team might again belong to an org. User might have account. User might also have teams. And when you draw these connections, you are essentially thinking, OK, I have my entities, which are your nouns which came from your activities, and now I'm trying to draw relationships between them. And now you are inching close towards a GraphQL schema. After this, what you have to do is simply combine all these relationships, and you end up with something like this. You have, and this is what we, we want to build. We want to build a graph schema which looks like a graph and not like different trees. And the corresponding uh, SDL looks very clean. You have org, team, and how they are related to each other. Moreover, this is a lot more scalable. Tomorrow, if a user has some extra properties, all of your uh, users in orgs, teams, and individual users are going to inherit the same properties without you having to do any extra work, which you ended up doing in the graph rest way. And this is the whole crux of what you get when you think structurally, when you think in a defined manner and end up with this schema. But you might ask me, how does it help me? Well, the way it helps you primarily is it helps you focus on domain interfaces. Because when we all work in teams, we all have certain languages, certain terms, which we are used to talking because we all understand. But they might not be the terms users understand or people outside your team understand. This approach helps you limit those and build an API which is user focus. This structure it acts like a forcing function to build an API which is external facing not looking inside out. You start from the user rather than starting from the restful APIs which already exist. And lastly, which I believe helps the most and is the most impactful, is it makes API development, GraphQL schema development, much more collaborative by involving a lot more personas. If you look at this, uh, it's just a simple table of how I think multiple personas in a team uh, are benefited with this approach. For example, if you are an engineering manager, the schema design and the process to design the schema is your only control point. Because resolvers, you can any, any day write better and better. Once you have got the schema right, you know that you have the base structure good to go, and rest all is implementation. A UX designer might work on developing a similar schema, uh, or similar, similar terms, which are used both, both in your mocks as well as in the API making this a much more collaborative and a coherent experience for everyone building, uh, building a product experience, both for your engineers as well as uh, for your users. And this was all I wanted to cover in this lightning talk. Uh, if you want to talk to me more about how we at Postman uh, use GraphQL, how we are migrating to GraphQL, or how, we, how you can use Postman to interact with your GraphQL APIs, I'm more than happy to talk to you. Uh, I'm here both today and tomorrow. Uh, you can also reach out to me on Twitter. Uh, that's pretty much it from my side. Thank you.